Back in session tonight on the rundown is the start of the General Assembly in Virginia and Maryland. A recap of top issues being tackled in Annapolis and history being made in Richmond. Plus a proposal that would overhaul part of DC's ticketing system and could save you some money in the long run. And what goes down must come up. A call for volunteers to help clean up wreaths at Arlington National Cemetery. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown. It's our newscast streaming for you. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Leon Harris. It is Wednesday, January 10th, and the first full day of the legislative session in Annapolis and Richmond. Lots to get to. Let's start in Virginia. Democrats now have a majority in both chambers. House and Senate Democrats came together to show unity and to spotlight diversity in their caucus. They outlined an ambitious agenda topped by increasing education funding, also gun safety legislation, including a ban on assault weapons is another priority. Mm -hmm. And they're also beginning the process of trying to put constitutional amendments on the ballot to protect abortion rights and same-sex marriage. But they signaled early opposition to Governor Glenn Youngkin's proposed tax cut package, which includes ending the car tax. And putting out a car tax proposal without making the hard decisions of building it into your budget and explaining exactly what you want to do is not serious policy making. It's a campaign stunt. And the governor needs to get out of campaign mode and start to get in the governing mode. Republicans are quick to point out, though, that Democrats only have a slim majority and they will need to work with the governor to get any significant legislation passed. They warned Democrats gun bills would likely be vetoed. Congratulations, Mr. Speaker. When the gavel dropped at noon today, history was made in the Virginia House of Delegates. Don Scott became the first black speaker in the 400 year history of the legislature. Scott represents Portsmouth. His political rise is anything but traditional. Get this. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, get this. After serving as an officer in the Navy, he had his third year in law school and Scott pleaded guilty to a drug conspiracy case. Mm -hmm. He spent eight years in federal prison before going on to finish law school and then open up a law practice. He was first elected to the legislature in 2019 and became the minority leader in 2022. During his speech, Scott reflected on the history of this moment. Every time I look around this room, I do oh. see this. I see the ghost of those people who worked here those black folks who were enslaved here, whose dignity and humanity was discounted right here in this room. I see those people and I know we, not just I, we carry their hopes and dreams. Scott will now have to work in a divided government with Republican Governor Glenn Youngkin. Now to the presidential race with the Iowa caucuses just five days away. Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis will go head to head in a debate tonight looking to close that gap with former President Trump's lead. It's the fifth and final debate before the primary season officially begins on Monday with those Iowa caucuses. Vivek Ramaswamy did not qualify and Trump declined the invitation as he has not participated in any debate so far. This as Chris Christie is dropping out of the GOP presidential race. The former New Jersey governor made the announcement this evening during a town hall in New Hampshire. His departure could make room for Nikki Haley to grow her support in the Granite State, where Christie had grabbed a slice of the anti-Trump Republican voters. And while former President Trump remains the clear frontrunner in the Republican nomination, for president, DeSantis and Haley are best positioned to vie for that second place spot. NBC News senior national correspondent Steve Kornacki breaks it down from the big board. Well, one of the big stories heading into the Iowa caucuses is not just the battle for first because Donald Trump has had such a big lead in the polling. This is our most recent NBC poll of Iowa. The question has become who's going to get second place here? I mean, we've had a very close race. Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley. Again, you see how tight they are in our most recent poll. Far behind Trump, but battling with each other for second. So let's take a look at that battle here for second place. So Ron DeSantis, let's take let's start with this. We asked in our poll, favorable, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the candidates? This is Iowa Republicans. And I think one thing that jumps out is DeSantis is very popular, well-liked by Iowa Republicans, more than Haley. Not quite as much as Trump, but more than Haley. The problem for DeSantis has been voters like him, Republican voters like him, but they like Donald Trump more. And DeSantis's message, especially on a lot of these cultural issues that he's stressed, he's been going after voters 
who like Donald Trump, he's been trying to peel them off, but they just seem to prefer Donald Trump more. That's what the polling is telling us. Take a look at this. We asked folks who are supporting Donald Trump in Iowa, who would your second choice be? Look at that, by a whopping margin, it's Ron DeSantis. So DeSantis's problem is he's got voters who like him, who are with him on the issues, but he's not managed to convince many of those voters that they should vote for him when Donald Trump is on the ballot too. They seem to prefer Trump to him. That's been his obstacle. We'll see if he can move through that. For Haley, the problem is more this. Look, this is independent voters in our Iowa poll, and you can see Trump is winning among them, but he's not doing nearly as well with independents as he is with other voters. Meanwhile, you see Haley, she's doing over 20% with independent voters. That's her strength. Her strength is independent voters, and it's Republicans who don't necessarily like Trump, but there aren't a lot of those Republicans, and independents don't play a huge role in the Iowa caucuses, so she's relying on those two groups as she battles DeSantis. We'll see who gets second, and if that matters, coming out of Iowa. Steve Kornacki, thank you. No one loves numbers more than Steve Kornacki. Yeah. <laughs> Unpaid parking tickets for motor vehicle infractions are a persistent problem in the district. Now there are three proposed bills that are aiming to cut down on the mounting costs for D.C. residents who aren't paying in time. News Force Dominique Moody explains how this legislation would work and why one council member thinks it is absolutely critical. Eliminating the doubling of fines for parking, traffic, and red light camera infractions are at the center of three bills proposed by D.C. Councilmember Trayon White and co-sponsored by Councilmember Vincent Gray. On Wednesday, during a news conference, Councilmember White said the accumulation of these fines prevent D.C. residents from getting out of the red. If he or she can't pay that ticket in a, in a reasonable amount of time, they say 30 days, that's a $2,000 ticket. The average Working class person in D.C. don't have an extra $300 in their paycheck to pay D.C. The Fair Motor Vehicle Fines and Penalties Act would prohibit parking debts from doubling, limit penalties to $10 and $15 for the cost of collections, and penalties for parking debts would begin after 90 days. Councilmember White says the current system is broken and claims that last year 60% of the fines issued by the automation system in D.C were issued in neighborhoods with high rates of black and brown residents. I uh, introduced these three measures in hope to alleviate some of the pressures on families, working class people, and everyday people in the district. The next piece of legislation would bring back D.C.'s ticket amnesty program, which would waive all doubling of fees and pass automatic traffic tickets for six months and allow D.C. residents to pay the initial amount on the initial infraction. D.C. residents and drivers tell NBC4 changes are needed. It's robbery. It's, it's robbery. It's not right. This needs to stop. They have to do something. The last bill allows drivers to register their vehicles despite failure or inability to pay the unpaid debts. That includes traffic fines and other penalties. So what's the estimated fiscal impact on all three bills? Roughly around $30 million. Uh, but I do know that the council introduced legislation yesterday that was in the upwards of $70 million to uh, create more traffic calming measures and to go out to people who have tickets. Before the three bills are put up to a vote, it must first go to the Transportation Committee for any changes and see if it's fully funded before it's voted on by the entire council. In the district, Dominique Moody, News 4. The district has taken a first step toward cracking down on speeding drivers. In a unanimous vote, the D.C. Council passed an amendment that would allow for more booting and towing of cars repeatedly involved in speeding, even when the tickets are paid. The bill is called the STEER Amendment Act, which stands for Strengthening Traffic Enforcement, Education and Responsibility. It would also give the D.C. Attorney General the right to sue drivers inside and outside D.C. for unpaid speeding tickets and will uh, give them the ability to suspend their driving privileges. The bill is expected to face a second vote by the council before going on to the mayor for approval. One of D.C. Mayor Mariel Bowser's goals for the new year is what she's calling the district's comeback. At today's Commercial Real Estate for Women, or CREW event, the mayor talked about how the organization and perhaps more women in the field could help the district rebound. How are we thinking about space that uh, would free up? You know, is it if, if the Cap 1 space materializes and we have five acres downtown? Well, we had 10 acres downtown and we built uh, city center. That's right. Uh, transformational development. 
The mayor went on to say that more opportunities for land and real estate in the district becoming available. It creates more room for more transformational development, and she said that adds more value to D.C.'s future. If you drive on the GW Parkway or 395 near the Pentagon, chances are you've noticed wreaths out on the graves at Arlington National Cemetery. Nearly a quarter million of them were laid in December by the organization Wreaths Across America. So next Saturday morning, volunteers are needed for Wreaths Out, and this is a great way to honor veterans and get your steps in. Mm -hmm. It is a huge cleanup project in our NBC4 and Telemundo 44 fam is coming together. You can join us by scanning the QR code. We're going to pop up on your screen. And I've done this for years. It's truly an incredible morning, Leon, mm -hmm. to get out there for some volunteering and some service. Rees Out is a day where the community comes out and helps honor our veterans. Um, it's the annual cleanup day that associates with Rees for Rees Across America. And you'll help pick up the wreaths that were laid previously in December, and they're going to be uh, disposed of. Dozens of civilian and military organizations, such as the Navy International Programs Office, show up to help for Wreaths Out. Many, like Rachel Lynn, have a special purpose. So my dad actually passed in 2018, and then he was interred here in early 2020. So it's a way that I still feel really connected to him and get to come out here a couple times a year and honor him. So that's why I do it. Everyone's there for their own reasons, and you just see everyone working together, trying to honor the fallen and the veterans, and uh, just paying respects to them. And it's really cool to see them all come together for that. Wreaths Out starts at 8 a.m. on Saturday, January 20th. And though there are significantly fewer volunteers who show up for the out versus the laying in December, it's still a pretty big job, removing a quarter million wreaths in just a few hours. Wear good walking shoes. It is, it's hilly, it's a lot of walking, it's a lot of steps. Commit as much time as you want. I think it's just a good event to make you feel like you're doing something, give back a little bit. You come, you can bring um, ropes, um, brooms, whatever, and really load up and try to pick up as many wreaths as possible. Yeah, make sure you're prepared for it. Bring food, bring some snacks. They're not hangry. Gotta love snacks. And Arlington National Cemetery also suggests bringing water, dressing for the weather, and maybe some work gloves to help the process go a little smoother. There's a couple other rules, too. We'll let you know about when you RSVP by scanning the QR code. You did that, right? You're going to join us? Grab your phone. Scan the QR code. There's been times, um, I think, when I've been here, I've done 20,000 steps in the morning. So, yeah, it's the workout for the day. 20,000 steps. That's and the last time we did it in 2019, the photo of our dear friend Wendy Rieger, she yeah. joined us. My radio partner Kelly and I uh, used to put together, to get a team together every year, and uh -huh. so now we're, we're bringing it here, and I'm so excited for people to get involved. I remember talking to Wendy after mm -hmm. she did it with you that one weekend, and she just she just gushed about it. Yeah. How, how wonderful it was and how beautiful the whole event was. I brought you a broom, Leon, so you take the broom <laughs> and you pick up the reeds one at a time, or a dog this leash. This is what I want to see. Yeah, so I bring the dog leash out, and I throw like four or five or six on, clip it, Throw it over your shoulder a la Santa Claus and you go to the dumpster. There you go. Gotta Pro be, tips. There's Pro a, tips. Always a system. <laughs> totally. All right. All right, folks, you can scan that QR code. Uh, there you see it on the screen. Or you can head to NBCWashington.com and search for Wreaths Out and sign up there. And you'll get your steps in and you tackle your first volunteering event of the year, which sounds like a win-win. True story. Thanks, Leon. Awesome. And here's a look at what we have coming up next on the News 4 Rundown. Coming up. You take your eyes off your laptop, even for a second. I woke up one morning to a text from an anonymous Instagram account. It was a nude photo of myself. She tells the News 4 I team how she helped catch a thief and her warning to you. Next on News 4. A warning now for those of you flying in the new year. What you're about to hear is a wake up call for anyone who takes their eyes off their baggage even for a few seconds. This is terrifying. A passenger shared her unbelievable story with the News 4 I team of the fallout after someone swiped her backpack. Consumer investigative reporter Susan Hogan joins us with what she learned. Heading home for the holidays took a very unexpected turn for this young woman. Put my backpack down for a second in the arrivals hall, and uh, when I went back for it, it was gone. We're calling her Jane. We're protecting her identity, and you'll understand why after you hear her story. So I'm a frequent traveler at Dulles Airport. Last December, Jane flew into Dulles from L.A. to spend the holidays with her family. But while waiting at baggage claim, someone stole her backpack. What was in the backpack? The most important thing, though, was my laptop, which I'd had for 10 years. 
10 years of data, pictures and memories of her life gone, including projects she was working on as a screenwriter and a short film producer working in L.A. Jane reported the theft to the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority, or MWA. They said that the theft probably would have been caught on camera, but they weren't confident they would be able to identify the person. That's because on any given day, more than 60,000 people pass through Dulles. But in this case, let's just say identifying the suspect would be easier than they thought. That's because according to police, the person caught on camera stealing her backpack worked here at the airport for smart cards. But the News 4 I team learned even though they ID'd the employee, he was not immediately arrested. In fact, according to the police report, he was able to stay on the job for more than a month. They couldn't arrest him yet because they needed more in order to get a search warrant to get my computer back. And then an unexpected message changed everything. I woke up one morning to a text from an anonymous Instagram account. And uh, when I opened that, it was a nude photo of myself. When you saw that nude photo of yourself, did you immediately realize where that came from? Yes. Where? It was on my computer. Jane said the nude photo was part of an art project and she hadn't sent it to anyone. She contacted the IMWA investigator working her case. The officer I spoke to told me that if I felt comfortable, I should try to talk to this person to get as much information from them as I could. Were you scared to start a dialogue with this person who was clearly creepy? Yeah, I really didn't want to, but I wanted to get my computer back. Jane did as the officer asked, started up a conversation, which she shared with the IT. I asked him, what do you want? And what did he respond? More of your photos. Did he start asking you for anything else other than just photos? Yeah, he asked me for $3,000. I think he just saw an opportunity to, I don't know, try and blackmail me. I was very upset. I mean, I'd never been in a situation like this before. Wanting to take control of the situation, Jane decided to do her own detective work. Using an online search tool, she figured out the suspect's IP address and even GPS coordinates. It came back as an IP address registered in Springfield, Virginia. And passed that on to police who did surveillance and eventually obtained a search warrant. It could have gone a different way. FBI Special Agent Fernando Uribe works sextortion cases like this and says normally a victim would not be encouraged to communicate with the person exploiting them. Well, we don't know these individuals' expertise online, right? They might be very good at manipulating um, electronic media or they might just understand what she's trying to do and then the scheme could get worse. But MWA spokesperson Rob Yingling defends the decision to pull Jane into the investigation saying their officers are fully trained just like police who work in local communities. All I can say is our police worked with the victim to obtain actionable evidence uh, that they were able to be able to move forward with a solid case. Police did eventually arrest the suspect and recover Jane's laptop, although it had been completely wiped clean. For an investigative process to play out in a lawful way, you have to be very methodical. And there's a lot of um, interagency work that also takes place because this investigation left the campus of the airport. Jane sued the suspect in small claims court, hoping to recoup the cost of the laptop and for emotional distress it brought her. She tells us the case was settled. My motivation was never to send someone to jail, per se. It was to get some form of justice for what I lost. Now, the I-team tried contacting the man accused of stealing her laptop, but we were unsuccessful. He was arrested on a number of charges, including threat to extort money. However, prosecutors dismissed those charges, and he ended up pleading guilty to petite larceny and received 12 months probation. Now, a spokesperson for SmartCart told the I-team, while law enforcement did not provide SmartCart with details of this investigation, SmartCart fully cooperates with law enforcement whenever called upon, SmartCart terminated his employment after MWA suspended his security badge. I'm Susan Hogan, News 4 IT.
Kind of crazy. The wow. victim had to step in and help solve the crime. She's an amazing detective, too. I'm telling you. That's crazy. All right. Wow. Still ahead, a chance to skate with and learn from one of the best. We're taking you to Hockey Clinic, put on by Cap superstar Alex Ovechkin, and explaining how it's giving players with special needs an amazing opportunity. Coming up. Coming up, we'll be marking the end of an era because this Friday will be the last day of the Donnie Simpson show. Whew. Donnie Simpson made the announcement this evening. He says that uh, he's been on the radio for 55 years. But he stressed he's not retiring. He just says that he's, good. he's excited about some upcoming opportunities coming his way, including his podcast and the reboot of the TV show Video Soul that really put him on the map. Nice. Donnie joined Magic eight years ago, and uh, our Tony Perkins joined him again on the air six years ago there. Tony tells us that Radio 1 is going in a different direction with Magic, moving to syndicated programming all day, with uh, the exception of the morning show there. So Donnie, make sure you check Donnie out on Friday. The voice of Washington Radio. He is. That guy. He is Washington. Yes, absolutely. He <laughs> sounds like it, and he is. That, that is incredible. What a run, and I love that he's like, you know what? No, I'm not done. We're just done here for now. Yeah, good for him. Love to see it. All right, the Washington Spirit has a brand-new head coach as well. He's one of the best in the world, and he's 32. But get this, he's got quite the resume. Jonathan Geraldez is currently in his third season as coach of Barcelona. The team won four consecutive Spanish League titles. In the past two and a half years, the record has been 71 and 1. And won. Geraldez also is one of three nominees for the 2023 Best FIFA Women's Coach. This is going to be great when he comes to town. He will be joining the Spirit in June when Barcelona's season is over. They haven't quite said yet who is going to have the job until then. Now, if you want to see soccer superstar Lionel Messi at Audi Field, you're going to have to pay up big time, folks. The March 16th game against Inter Miami is the only one that you can't currently buy on the team's site. Hmm. But Ticketmaster already has some options for you. The tickets went on sale to the general public this morning. And the cheapest ticket we found, $446. Wow. The most expensive, over $4,100. For comparison, tickets for the home game coming up after this one against Montreal, they started $32. It's a whole messy of money to pay trouble. that. Yes, it Thank is. Thank goodness. That is a lot of cash <laughs> to go see that it. soccer match. So while Alex Ovechkin is busy chasing history, he's also bringing smiles to a group of special needs youth hockey players in our area. Yeah, Gio Delfa has more from MedStar Capitals Iceplex in Arlington. The Washington Capitals and Alex Ovechkin hosted the American Special Hockey Association with nearly 50 players at an incredible event here at the MedStar Capitals Iceplex. Halfway through the Capitals season and the day before a game, Ovi taps the brakes and spends the day giving kids memories that'll last a lifetime. For me personally, like I'm enjoying to, to see their smiles in their face. You know, they uh, skating around, they uh, talk to the players. You know, a couple uh, uh, new new uh, faces in the team, uh, and they uh, spend time with the kids. Yeah, I think it's uh, for them. It's uh, they're just going to be remember it, and uh, they're going to uh, have fun. Their reactions to getting to spend time with Ovi priceless. I was like, whoa, that's so cool. Since its establishment in 2007, ASHA has remained committed to individuals with intellectual, developmental, and physical disabilities through the sport. One of the joys I've had seen is kids who normally don't talk are really expressing themselves and saying how important it was to them. And they're telling their parents, they're telling their school teachers, they're telling everybody, I got to do this. And that use of the, that language and being able to share and express, that's priceless to so many families. Ovi has been an ambassador for the organization since the first skate in 2014 and most recently made a donation to help cover ice costs for 136 special hockey teams across the United States. Having somebody who is your captain, your ambassador, the person who's always cheering you on, that is who Alex has been for us. And that makes sure that every single athlete with a developmental disability here in the United States knows that they have a champion. Take away from an event like this? When you're doing something that everyone, including your family, says that you probably can't do, and then you're doing it, and you're doing it halfway decently, better than a lot of your friends, that's pretty special. The kids had a blast. The families and coaches assured me that this was an event that they would be talking about for a really long time. For News 4 Sports, I'm Gio Delfa.
What a guy. Gio, thank you very much. And Ovi was not the only cap doing some good today in the community. Tom Wilson honored at a luncheon today as one of the Washingtonians of the year by the magazine for his charitable work. See, a very hockey fashion. Wilson is sporting a banged up <laughs> nose for his injury this week that I asked him about. I was like, what's up with the nose, buddy? He wouldn't look right without one. No, no. <laughs> you also saw their Maryland football head mm -hmm. coach, Mike Loxley, uh, also among those honored for his contribution to the D.C. area, as was our very own Sean Yancey, who you see there with her family. Washingtonian says they chose Sean because of her commitment to the community with her nonprofit Giving Foundation for Women and Children, which includes programs to provide essential items to those in need. They absolutely did some heroic work this past holiday season absolutely. between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, great work by Sean and her family. Congratulations, dear. We know we, you know we love you. She's got a volunteer organization, 100%. It's really cool to see the work that she does after she's done with the work that she does here. Exactly. And a shout out too to uh, Doreen Gensler and yeah. Tom Sherwood. Tom were Sherwood there was today. there. Yeah, it was a good time at the Washingtonian of the Year luncheon. That'll All right, it. congratulations. That'll do it for us in the rundown. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Leon Harris. Thanks for joining us. We hope that you will stay safe and that we will see you back here tomorrow.